email and then the website will be up and if you want to check out sessions that you um, didn't go to, then you can do that. Um, uh, you know, coming back to the website. Um, I want to just say, I want to say a million thank yous, but for the sake of time, I want to say that um, PA Days was the work of many. And I feel personally, I feel so blessed that there are so many people who respond quickly and um, are so generous with their time and their thoughts um, and their work. Uh, we lots of people put a lot of brainstorming into this. If you read the about page on the website, I listed some people who really put in a lot of work. Um, we had a group called Meeting of the Minds, uh, just a group of uh, faculty members across campus. We started meeting last February. And um, then, you know, COVID happened, but uh, it's been very helpful to get input from lots of people about what faculty needs uh, needs for professional development, what they want. And um, so thank you, thank you. Uh, and especially to all of you who are uh, presenting today. Uh, it's a lot. We we all are in you know learning about this new all virtual world and um so i really appreciate all of your time um i learned a new phrase this morning from anicia dillard if you don't know anicia dillard is uh, the coordinator of the cte and um none of this would happen without her not a darn thing <laughs> so Thank you, Anisia. Um, but anyway, she said, make sure everyone takes bio breaks. And I said, what kind of breaks? Um, bio breaks, you know, like stand up, walk around, get a drink, go to the bathroom. So uh, make sure you take your bio breaks. And um, I think the last thing I'll say is we are very thrilled um, that uh, Four members of the executive. Um, okay, sorry, Patrick is. I'm having okay. Karen send out a YouTube live stream. Oh, okay. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, how? Okay, so people I'm will. Having Karen send it out. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. That makes me feel so much better. I turned off my ringer because I I I feel so bad. People are saying they can't see the session. Um. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. I'm, I think we're going to be on time. Um, it's 9.08, and I just want to say um, we're really so happy to have four members of our executive, executive leadership team joining us today. Each one of them um, will do about 15 to 20 minute presentation. When they're finished, we'll take a five minute break, and then there will be a half an hour of Q&A. Uh, so you can type your questions into the chat and um, <clears throat> then there will be a short lunch break and we'll start right in with the first round of live sessions. Um, on the website, there's a printable schedule, kind of easy to browse through. And then also you'll see, um, if you click on day one, you'll see everything that's happening today and when. Okay. so. Um, if I seem uh, distracted, it's just because people are Skyping me right now, so sorry. Um, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker of the morning. Um, the title of, of his topic is A New Year, and I am very happy to introduce our new LCC right, president. Yep. All right, sir. Sorry, I was hearing Patrick over there. Uh-oh, everything's okay. Okay, our new LCC president, Dr. Steve Robinson. We're so happy to have you. And I'm gonna turn off my mic <laughs> and hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Megan and Patrick, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. I learned that's a best practice to ask a particular person if they can hear you rather than ask the whole group. We're all learning uh, about how to do this. Thank you so much 
And if I could, before we launch into this, are we set with the ability for folks to join, Patrick? Uh, we've got a YouTube link going up. If you're on the call and your colleagues are asking you, I'm guessing uh, share that there's a YouTube link that's being shared. Is that is that excellent? So there's a new operations email going out to everyone. Feel free to share that with your colleagues if they're having a hard time getting in. Who knew we'd get a, a visit from the digital fire marshal this morning? <laughs> um, Happy New Year, everyone. It is wonderful to be with you. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be the first of many people to welcome you to the spring 2021 semester. I hope you had a healthy and regenerative holiday break. Uh, I want to say thank you also to our LCC colleagues who worked over the break because a, a number of us were here doing things uh, in certain departments, specifically facilities and public safety. And mentioning public safety, uh, before I enter into my remarks, I do want to take some time to provide some special recognition for our, our LCC public safety department. As you know, this is a difficult time in our country as we struggle with racial injustice and social unrest. It's also a difficult time for law enforcement and our LCC public safety department. We're engaging in a vital and necessary conversation about equity and injustice in policing. And I recognize that our own department has been the topic of conversation and have been under the microscope. I want them to know that I'm really proud of our public safety department and the men and women who keep our campus community safe. If we were all gathered here together, I would ask us to provide a big round of applause for our LCC first responders uh, for appreciation. So let's, let's do that. Thank you so much. I love the theme this morning um, of uh, uh, reflection and moving forward. And I'm excited to share some of my reflections on the prior year and my thoughts and vision for the future. I also plan to provide you with the gift of time this morning. My remarks will not take the entire 20 minutes, so we'll get to the break earlier than is in the schedule before we have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Samuel. Um, I'm sure you've noticed that in our online meetings, they tend to blend right one into one another. You hang up on one and start another uh, without the customary travel time or passing time between them. Uh, that can be exhausting. And I noticed that the uh, CTE team intentionally built in some breaks, uh, that bio time is, is important. Uh, we built that into the schedule, so thanks uh, uh, to the CTE folks for thinking of that ahead of time. We are all anxious to put 2020 in the rearview mirror. And it's uh, important to recognize that this past year was difficult. It was filled with stress and difficult decisions. Right at the end of last semester, for example, we made the difficult decision to cancel indoor sports for the semester. And this is hard on our student athletes, on their families, our coaching staff. We had to do a lot of difficult work last semester. And I am so proud of our faculty, staff, and students for all they accomplished under these extraordinary circumstances. But before we close the book on 2020, we really should take some time to celebrate what we accomplished. We continued to fulfill our mission as a, community, a comprehensive community college during a global pandemic. We moved our instruction online, we completed our students in applied learning, and most importantly, we kept our faculty, students, and staff safe from COVID-19 using a people-first approach. We also developed our equity action plan, presenting it to the board this December and, and uh, this past December. And there'll be more information about the work ahead in the presentation from Dr. Bailey. We also kicked off our strategic planning refresh process. And you'll hear more about that from Dr. Samuel. Uh, we revised the college budget, reinstating salary increases uh, in, in negotiations with our great uh, union partners. And we reinstated funding for programs like Foundations for Success and non-credit ESOL. We did a lot last semester. Uh, we also onboarded a new president uh, during a, a time when we can't gather together. 
uh, a, a new president with a different approach, a different learning style. And that kind of change is never easy. <coughs> so if you're like me, you spent a lot of time reflecting on last semester over the break. Uh, fall 2020 was my 29th uh, launch of an academic year as a community college professional. For the first 15 of those years, I was a full-time faculty member, and these past 14, I've been a proud staff member and administrator. Now, despite all the difficulties of last semester, fall 2020 was one of the most engaging of my career, and that's thanks to the warm welcome provided by all of you. I'm so grateful to everyone who invited me to team meetings and department meetings, and I especially enjoyed the opportunities I had to interact with our students. So as you move forward into this semester, please reach out to me if there are meetings or virtual events you'd like me to attend. It's been an interesting and rewarding challenge to connect on a new campus during COVID. So I'd like to thank Media Services, Lane Ingram, and all of you for creating digital spaces where I could interact through technology and video like we're doing today. I wanna to thank you for reading my many emails and blog entries. Uh, and I wanna thank Jim Luke and the CTE Open Learn Lab for creating a new blogging platform for me. I'll be moving my president's blog to that platform this se uh, semester. And I would like to remind our campus community about two podcasts that I've launched to engage and promote our campus community and alumni. The first is called Teachable Moment. It's a podcast where LCC faculty and staff teach me cool ideas from their areas of expertise. It's a lot of fun. The second is called LCC Alumni Stories, and it's a podcast that highlights our amazing alumni. We were able to produce several episodes of these podcasts last semester. They're all up on the president's page on our website, along with a form you can fill out if you'd like to be a guest on the show or if you have a, an alumni you'd like to suggest for the podcast. Uh, I especially want to thank Lang, Lane Ingram and Pam Blundy in my office for amazing production on these podcasts, as well as expert audio engineering from Brock Elsesser. Uh, Brock and I have an interesting workflow on these audio aspect of these uh, podcast projects. You know, I do the field recording and we trade the files online and, and he turns them in, into uh, uh, amazing audio. So finally, I would like to invite you to uh, in, follow me on social media where uh, I'm always out promoting LCC and community colleges. Uh, along with our amazing social media and communications professionals, I'm constantly talking up all things LCC and Lansing on Twitter. And if you're interested in seeing a more personal uh, look about my day-to-day, -day, including photos of my pets and food and visually inter interesting stuff I encounter, follow me on Instagram. My handle on both of those platforms is at LCC President. So 2021 is filled with opportunity for LCC, and I'm really optimistic about our future. Uh, but we need to recognize that the factors that made 2020 so difficult are very much still with us. The promise of vaccines and economic recovery are real, uh, and I'm excited about that. But the challenges that we faced last year are far from over. We need to continue to follow safety protocols to mitigate the virus and keep it off of our campuses. And some of the effects of the pandemic on mental health and well being are cumulative. Just the fact that we had a break will not magically make them go away. The fatigue and the burnout are real, and we need to recognize that. So I would refer all of our faculty and staff back to my December communications about mental health, about work-life balance, and about our employee assistance program. We need to emerge from this challenge as a healthy, resilient college because our community needs us. So our shared vision for the future of LCC is still the same. More than ever, our work is vital for the success of the region we serve High quality and affordable pathways to university transfer will be more important than ever. And meaningful credentials that lead to family sustaining wages will be key to recovery in our region. Through our participation in achieving the dream, 
we'll need to align and intensify our great efforts to improve student achievement and address equity gaps and outcomes. And like nearly every community college, our enrollment has declined due to this pandemic. This means that we've lost some of our most vulnerable students. And in my view, one of our greatest challenges will be to reconnect with the students we've lost, to help them get back on path, and to do everything we can to ensure the success of the students we serve. So in closing, I'm really proud of all that our faculty and staff continue to accomplish. It's an honor to be your colleague, and I look forward to other meaningful and impactful work that we'll do this year. And I want to leave you with the words of one of our students. From the past two semesters, uh, Professor Kirk's students have written me letters. I love receiving these letters. They've been wonderful to read. And I wanna leave you with some remarkable feedback uh, that was contained in one of those letters from last semester. This is from a student named uh, Taziana. Uh, Professor Neen Kirk uh, tells me that she asked to be referred to as Taz. Uh, and so I'm gonna read directly from Taz's letter. And, and I think you're gonna really like this feedback that she provides and I'm quoting now. I did an interview with a fellow student and they said the education they were getting here was challenging their mind in the best way possible. They decided to go to LCC because it was affordable. The environment showed that the school wants them to succeed and the education they would receive there would get them ready for a four-year university. They appreciate the response LCC has had with the current pandemic COVID. They feel as if the school is concerned about their well being, and the steps that they took to make sure everyone was safe is something that some colleges have yet to do. I agree with them. My first semester has started in the middle of a pandemic, and I feel like the school is doing their best at trying to help the students. The professors respond to you as quickly as possible, and they help you if you're having a hard time keeping up. This semester has been hard, but I am happy with my choice of going to LCC, end quote. Now, I just loved reading that. Uh, Taz and I have that in common. My time here at LCC also started in the middle of a pandemic. And I'm very happy and grateful to be here. And I know that every member of our campus community should be proud of this kind of student feedback. This is why we're here. You know it, I know it, and you have been able to continue doing this for our students under extraordinary circumstances. So I just wanna say thank you. I encourage you to enjoy and engage in this year's professional activity days. I look forward to seeing you this semester, even if it'll be through our webcams and screens. And, um, I would ask that you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. We're gonna have a wonderful day. Um, <laughs> I just realized I was um, uh, uh, putting some things in the chat and it was all going privately to Patrick Butcher <laughs> and not to you all, but anyway, I figured it out. <laughs> so. Um, uh, so it's my understanding, uh, people are telling me that this is live streaming on YouTube. So uh, I don't think anyone knew there was a 200 person limit. I, I know we certainly did not know. Um, and so, so awesome for the fast work, whoever's doing that behind the scenes stuff. Patrick, <laughs> thank we you have, so yeah. much. Yeah. We have 308 people viewing, 305 on YouTube. Holy moly. Wow, okay, <gasps> that makes me nervous. Um, so again, Dr. Robinson, thank you. We are thrilled, um, so happy to have you uh, here with us on PA Days. Hopefully you'll check out our website too. I know you're busy, but there's some cool stuff. Um, and so uh, I, I, Selena, Dr. Samuel, are you here? Are you? 
Um, our schedule says that we're gonna have a five minute break. Um, so let's do that. It is 925, we'll, we're, we'll be five minutes ahead of schedule. Let's come back here at 930 and we will hear from our next keynote speaker, Dr. Selena Samuel. I will reintroduce her when we rejoin. So take a quick bio break, okay? Thanks everybody. Does anyone know how to turn on camera? Um, you click the start video button. At the bottom of your screen, um, there, there should be a button that says start video. Yeah, mine is just keep showing in a red. It don't turn to uh, green. <laughs> huh. I start having our trouble and since yesterday. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you about that. Mm. I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. I I don't know yeah. if it was if it was trouble since yesterday. Yes. It seems like that's something deeper that I can help with today. I'm so I'm so sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> sorry, uh, is that Pushpa? Who who is I couldn't see who was talking. The cast. Oh, oh yes. Okay. Okay. I knew. Like I recognize the voice. Patrick, are we all set with the presentation, or would you like me to share my screen? Just give me a second here. Strategic and operational planning, right? Yes, sir. There we go. Thank you. I'm actually going to hand off presenter to you, and then you can actually navigate with the Arrows on the right hand side or left hand side. Okay. Uh, so, let's see. Try it out, see what we can. You said on the left hand side? Yeah, on the left hand side of the. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Yep. And if you. Thank you. The button at the top of that, the little four boxes, uh -huh. will drop down your entire like strip of slides what we won't see that on our end so you can navigate that link thank you patrick yep. patrick i have a quick question um for each presenter when it's their turn you'll make them the presenter and then they'll be able to access the sharing button correct yeah i forgot okay my share button. Hi. Good morning. This is Tanya. Is not working. Right. That's that's fine, Tanya. I can uh, run stuff from my end. Thank and you so much, Patrick. Is it? We had somebody that was trying to get on YouTube and could not use the interpreter because they're further down the screen. Can they be put as a co-host? Any one of the interpreters, so the YouTube uh, people can see that. What I have right now is I have it on focus mode, so it switches to the active speaker. Because if I don't, it shows like everyone. Um, we're trying to get them in. Um, if I can have, let's get, see if we can get the number down to 190 or yeah, 190, just so we can get them in. So if I can have 10 people disconnect and use the YouTube link. This is Drew, I'll go ahead and disconnect to okay. go to the YouTube. All right. You guys have thank to go you. to YouTube as well. Right. Thank you, thank you. I, I that sounds so awful. Like, will you please disconnect? But um, okay. anyone who's willing to watch on YouTube, that would be helpful. And thank That's you so right. much. I, I'm communicating with the faculty member to let them know to try to get back in. So I will let you know when we're good. Okay. Thanks, Anicia. 
Thank you. Thank you to everyone who's Thank moving you. to YouTube. It's much appreciated. Sorry. <sighs> Live and learn, right? <laughs> um, uh, for the person whose camera wasn't working, um, I see in the chat, is there another application trying to use your camera? Maybe if you, if you um, turn everything else off. Yeah, I don't know right now. It's, it's hard to diagnose when I'm not. Uh, Dr. Robinson, yes, it, I, I see you're willing to move to YouTube, but if you could please stay, that would be oh, you stay. Yeah, you stay because we do. I'm not going anywhere. I just wanted to make sure I could make a spot for somebody. But I think in order to participate in the panel, everybody's on the panel is going to have to stay connected, right? Yes, yes, yes. Got Thank it. you. Got it. Thank you for everybody working through these technical issues. Well done. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay. You can, people can stop disconnecting now. We're down to 164, so we're good. We've got capacity to get them on. Dr. Sally Welch, no, you may not sign off. <laughs> <laughs> no, none of the co-hosts should sign off. We, we, have, we have capacity now. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I, I want to uh, hear from Anisia um, about the interpreters. Are we good? Um, she's checking. Okay. Okay. So. Um, uh, Megan. Yeah. The, the meeting is saying it's full. It's not letting in. Uh, it should be good now. Uh, it should be okay now because we had several people sign off um, and they're watching on YouTube. Yep. Uh, there was an email that w that went out from operations yep. um letting people know they can watch the live stream on youtube so if, if whoever's getting text messages um from colleagues if you could let them know that that would be fabulous I've yeah, I, I just double checked you should be able anyone else should be able to connect to the meeting now um let's just we're waiting for um our uh, student that needs a sign interpreter to join. Yep. A sign interpreter. Oh, so just take a deep breath, and <laughs> I'm sure we'll hear in a minute, and we'll be good to go. See that gift of time was was needed. Yep. Okay some confirmation that we do some more people could join here we are okay for people joining right now Yeah, Anissa is confirming that it's we're good to keep going. Okay. All right. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I am very happy to introduce our next keynote speaker. Um, and I just I just noticed uh, I was looking at my my list of our four keynotes, and it's like our new president, and the next person isn't new to LCC, but in a new position. And I'm really happy that she said, yes, I would like to do this presentation for everybody. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to introduce LCC's Senior Vice President of Business Operations, Dr. Selena Samuel. Welcome, Selena. I'm gonna mute and you take it away. All right. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that warm introduction. And I also just really want to echo some of the things that Dr. Robinson said, which was that this college has done some incredible things throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And I just want to express my appreciation from everyone. I've seen it firsthand from our academic areas to our student support, to our financial services, 
to our police and public safety. There's just been a lot of great work, so I appreciate everyone. And I also want to say a special thank you to Dr. Sally Welch, who asked me if I would participate in PA days and specifically to talk about strategic planning. So what I'd like to do is I am going to get to strategic planning, but we're going to talk about planning overall at the college. And so just bear with me as we get through some of that information. And then also before I begin, I just want everyone to keep in mind that we do plan on continuing our tradition of making sure that our employees have a voice during our strategic planning process. So as I go through the presentation, I want you to be assured that employees will be a part of the process. And towards the end of the presentation, I'll give you more information on what that will look like. So I'm excited to get started. Thank you all in advance for your time and attention. So when we talk about planning for Lansing Community College, we are looking at it in two different ways. We're looking at it from a strategic perspective and from an operational perspective. When you think about a strategic plan, we're talking about something that is long term, something that is somewhere between three and 10 years. So the easy one to point out is our strategic plan that we do every three to five years. Most people are familiar with that, but that also includes an academic master plan, a campus master plan, and our capital outlay plan. Now, when we talk about operational plans, those are shorter term plans, which are one to three years. And for LCC, that could be a plan that your division put together. It could be a strategic plan for marketing. It could be a strategic plan for student affairs, but it's very division specific, excuse me, specific. But it also could be something large like our equity action plan. So we've got a lot of different planning processes that we're going to be doing in the college in the future. And for me, this is something that's exciting because we are really being proactive in all areas of the college. Today, I really want to focus on strategic plans in general. Now, everyone's familiar with our overarching strategic plan, and that plan talks about where we are as a college and where we want to be in the future. And that's pretty much what all strategic plans do. They tell a story. They talk about where the organization is, where the organization wants to be in the future, and how they believe they can get to that future state, and if there's any measures that they can account for so that they can be accountable for meeting their goals. And so all of our strategic plans will have some element of that. Most people are familiar with our strategic plan, which is our overarching plan for the college. But what we're looking to do is use that strategic plan to build our academic master plan out. So when you look at the academic master plan and some of the components, you'll notice that it says, it is developed from the strategic plan because there's a direct relationship and a direct alignment, which is important. So in addition to the strategic plan, our academic master plan takes in consideration data, various metrics, our current programming, what we wanna do for future programming, and really what financial, human, and physical resources do we need to make this happen? Now, the other strategic plans that I'd like to mention would be our campus master plan and our capital outlay. So the campus master plan is really talking about what are we going to do with our facilities? But in terms of having a really good campus master plan, that means we really need to have our academic master plan in place and our strategic master plan in place so that our campus master plan can build off of it. We really need to know the direction of the college. We need to know what we're doing from an academic standpoint, what new programs are coming up, and how that will impact space utilization on our campuses. So that's really important. And I also have here the capital outlay, which is something that the state of Michigan requires us to always have a five-year plan. And it really does come from the capital master plan. But as you can see, even the capital outlay plan is built from the strategic plan, the academic master plan, and the campus plan. So more clearly, if you look at this particular diagram, it shows the relationship between all the planning processes at the college. And one thing that I'd like to point out is that the strategic plan continues to be our overarching plan. 
And through that plan, we're able to build other plans. So when you decide to be a part of the strategic planning process, you really are lending your voice and your influence on what the college is gonna do in the future in so many different areas. So if you look at this, we can start with the academic master plan. As you can see, it's built from the strategic plan, but there's also an emphasis on the influence of the equity action plan. And it goes on where you can see the campus map master plan builds from that and so on and so forth. And so even though I only have the federal agenda and the grant strategy here listed as operational plans, the same thing would go for a operating plan for student affairs or any other department. They just build off of our strategic plan and our academic master plan. Everything kind of builds off of each other. And as you can see, our mission and vision is also important in this process. But the idea here is just that we as a whole have an understanding of how we're looking to plan in the future at the college. We have our strategic plan, but we wanna make sure that we're building other plans from that strategic plan. Now that we have a little bit of background on planning at the college, I wanna talk specifically about our strategic plan refresh process. If you follow our operations emails, you will know that our current strategic plan is going to expire in October of this year. And so what we wanna do is have another strategic plan in place and approved by the Board of Trustees prior to that time. So as we started to look at our strategic plan and the next process and what we wanted to do, the first thing we had to do as an executive leadership team is a SWOT analysis. So we looked at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that we saw from our current strategic plan so that we can figure out, you know, how do we move forward from here? And one of the things that we thought was, hey, you know, we have a really great framework for the focus areas. And these focus areas are areas that other community colleges are addressing too within their strategic plan. So we know that we're aligned with some best practices, right? But we also thought that for LCC, one of our major, major goals is to really make sure that we embed diversity, equity, and inclusion in everything that we do at the college. So we decided to make that a separate strategic focus area. And that's really important. In addition to it being a separate strategic focus area, we are going to embed diversity, equity, inclusion in all of our other focus areas. And you see them on the screen, but I will just read them in case there's someone who does not have them. Our focus areas are community engagement, leadership, culture, and communication, engaged learning and student success, competitiveness and innovation, resource management and fiscal responsibility. And now through the refresh process, we're adding diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what's gonna be different about this strategic planning process than the ones that we've done in the past? Well, I'd like to say that some things will be the same. We will still look at our strategic planning process as an opportunity to confirm who we are to confirm our mission, vision, values, where we wanna go, our programs and services, and the value that we bring to the public. So we, we will do all that through our strategic plan. We will also confirm our priorities. Dr. Robinson went over some of them earlier today, but we will confirm our priorities. What will be different is that we will make sure that there's an emphasis on aspiration. When Dr. Robinson first came to the college, one of the things that I asked him was, in terms of our strategic plan, you know, is there anything that you believe is missing? And his comment was, it could be more aspirational. So when we go through this process, we really wanna think about the college and where do we wanna be? What areas would we like to be a leader in? We've done really well with our emergency management. Maybe that's an area that we wanna say, we want to be recognized as a leader in emergency management. You know, we've also done well with our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative, and we're doing some things that you're not going to see everywhere. So that's another opportunity to show our leadership. Do we want to be an Aspen college? Do we want to be recognized in some way? So we want to be aspirational, and we want to do that with every single focus area. So that's something that we'd like the college to be aware of as we embark on this process. The other thing that will be different is that we want to focus on strategic issues. Now you might ask, what is a strategic issue? 
for the purposes of our strategic planning process, we're going to say that it's a change or a challenge that's affecting higher education. It can affect our mission, academic programs, student success, our employees, our revenue sources, and even our external stakeholders. And because of the fact that the strategic issues can affect these things, we want to deal with them. So let's take a deeper dive at strategic issues. So here on the screen, you'll see some examples of it. We know that diversity is a strategic issue that we need to deal with. In fact, it's a national issue. So when we put our strategic plan together, we wanna to make sure that we are dealing with the fact that diversity is an issue and we're addressing it in a proactive way. The achievement gap between our students, we wanna make sure that we address achievement gaps. We also wanna make sure that we address health and safety and emergency management. Those are strategic issues that are becoming more and more important on college campuses. We also wanna look at market relevance. We wanna make sure that all the programs that we're providing are relevant to our marketplace, that the programs that we provide are programs that employers are interested in having students come work after they finish these programs. We also wanna address enrollment decline. Yes, COVID-19 brought on enrollment decline, but even before COVID-19, there was a decline in enrollment in Midwestern colleges. So it's not an LCC thing per se, but we need to make sure that we're thinking about strategic issues through our strategic planning process. So some of the other things that we want to address is cybersecurity. We want to address competition because we know that students can learn anywhere. Not only can they learn from any institution, but they can learn anywhere and they have preferences and how they would like to learn. And the market for education is extremely competitive, especially when you have large employers making decisions that they would like to train their own employees. That will impact us. So dealing with all these strategic issues, identifying them, acknowledging them, figuring out what does this mean for LCC? What does it mean for our future? What does it mean specifically for each key focus area? Those are the type of conversations that we wanna have because if we are proactive instead of reactive, then we can mitigate risk. And we can also carve a place out for this college for our sustainability and for us to be a leader in certain areas. So that's something that we'll be talking about more through the strategic planning process. I just really wanted to introduce the concept of strategic issues. Now with those strategic issues, when you're a part of the strategic planning process here at the college, we're gonna take a guided strategic thinking process. We're gonna look at strategic issues and how they impact all of our focus areas. And we're gonna take each focus area one by one and we're gonna ask some questions. Some of the questions that we'll be asking would be, what are the strategic issues facing this focus area? What makes these issues strategic? And what are the consequences of us not addressing this strategic issue? If we know that the demographics of our students are changing, and that could be demographics um, you know, for, their, for their race, for their age, you know, any of those, socioeconomic factors. And if we know that we've got changing demographics and socioeconomic factors of our students, then you know, how do we address that? If we know that the age of college students you know, is somewhat changing the traditional age, then how do we address that? If we know that there's more competition, how do we address that? If we know that there are public partnerships that could be beneficial to us, how do we address those things? So those are some of the questions that we're gonna ask. And we're also gonna to wanna to know you know, once we develop our goals, are they measurable? And is there any way that we could incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion considerations within our goals for each focus area? So those are the type of things that we're gonna think about. But once we get our goals together, we're also gonna say, well, if we try to achieve this particular goal, how is it gonna impact human, financial, and physical resources? How will it impact our ability to build on our strengths and to take advantage of unique opportunities in the marketplace? How will it minimize, help us minimize or overcome weaknesses that we may have? How will it make us remain relevant? How will it help us with additional opportunities for innovation? You know, how will it help us create public value? 
how will it help us decide what our grant strategy should be and what our focus is for our federal agenda should be? How does this impact internal and external stakeholder expectations? How does it impact the Board of Trustees priorities? So those are the type of questions that we will ask as we go through the process. And it really is a brainstorming it's a thinking process, it's very collaborative. No one person is gonna be able to identify every single strategic issue facing the college, but together we will identify those issues that are most important and address those issues so that we can be sustainable and also so that you know our students can be successful so that we can meet the mission and vision that we have for the college and serve the community that have placed their educational needs in our care. Now, how do we get involved in this process? As I said before, strategic planning at the college will remain collaborative. And we are looking to do the same thing that we've done in times past, which is have February, Friday meetings for all employees where you can provide input on the strategic plan and how it's developed and what our goals and objectives are. There are some, a little bit of differences. Obviously, we normally, we would have a lunch and it'd be great. But this time we're going to do it virtually, so we're trying to make some provisions so that you will still be able to get your voice heard, that it will still be an interesting interactive opportunity for you to lend your voice. So we're going to start this process in February. So it will start with the first Friday in February, which is February 5th. And we're actually going to start with a celebration and kickoff of our previous strategic plan because there were a lot of people that participated in the process that worked on work groups and we accomplished a lot. So we do wanna make sure that we celebrate the success that we had with our previous plan, as well as kick off the new refresh process. And as you can see here, we have a schedule where every Friday we will work on one of the focus areas. The first Friday, we will work on community engagement and leadership culture and communication. And as you can see, the other Fridays will cover the other focus areas. We intentionally try to schedule this in such a way that it does not interfere with any academic Senate meetings. And we also scheduled it in such a way that we have a single focus area being discussed at a time. So if we have an employee that would like to lend their voice to every single focus area, when we have these planning sessions, they will have an opportunity to do so. So it's set up so that you can lend your voice anytime you want. The other thing that you'll notice here is that when we put together our strategic planning work groups, our goal, and before I get to that, I have some dates on here for March that I should probably explain. In March, we're also gonna have student and community listening sessions. So I wanna make sure that, that I explain that. The listening sessions are going to be a little bit different than what we're doing as employees. The listening sessions are going to be an opportunity for us to truly just listen to student and community voices so that we know their thoughts on where we're going to be in the future. And as you can see, we will start with our sessions in February. The community and student sessions will be in March. But at the end of March, we'll have a strategic planning follow-up session that everyone will be welcome to attend. And the importance of that session is that we're gonna take all the information that we learned from our February sessions and our March sessions and provide an overview of where we are for each strategic focus area. And then we're gonna invite people to sign up for the work group of their interests. And obviously participating will be optional, but I highly encourage it because it's a great opportunity for you to lend your voice to what the college is doing in the future. Now over to the to my right, potentially your left, um, I have a, a box here that talks about what the strategic plan work group will be made of. And so this is our preferred participant structure. We're looking at having an ELT member lead. And we're also looking at having academic senate help identify someone else to lead along with the ELT member. We're also looking at having a non-management person lead. And so we're calling it a tri-lead process where we have this leadership structure where we've got someone from ELT, Academic Senate, and someone from the non-management side of things that can provide some input for each and every focus area. 
We're also looking to have someone from financial services serve on each focus area group so that if I'm working in community engagement and we come up with something that may cause us to have additional financial resources, we can easily have a conversation about that before we firm up what our goal is for that area. We also want to have someone from Center for Data Science be involved with every single focus group. So if the group is together and we're thinking that we want to measure our success for a particular item, we can have somebody already on hand to say, okay, this is what we like to measure it. What is the best way to measure it? Can we measure this? And we'll know that up front before we place it in our strategic plan. And then also we'd like to have a subject matter expert. So if we do have somebody that works with um, the community engagement work group and they have experience working with the community, we consider that to be valuable. So we want their input. And then, of course, we will have any other interested party that would like to be a part of these work groups. So obviously there's going to be six work groups. And one other thing that I'd like to mention is we have these dates outlined for the strategic planning sessions, but we know that this may not work for everyone's schedule. So what we will do is we have a web, excuse me, we have an email address. It's strategicplan at lcc.edu. And if anyone wants to participate by just sending their thoughts, they can do that too through that email address. And we will monitor that email address for thoughts and opinions about the future of LCC through close of business on March 12th. So that's important for you to know. And that email address can be used by students and community members and employees. We just wanna make sure that we have a mechanism for people to say what they wanna say, even if they can't participate in any of these optional meetings. The other thing that I wanna share with you about the strategic plan development schedule is that once we get those work groups identified in March, the work begins in April and May. We wanna set aside April and May for those work groups to get together confirm the strategic issues that we're gonna address for each focus area, because it may be a different list for each focus area. And they will also come up with some potential goals and metrics for each focus area. So that's gonna be really important, but they will have a two month time period to come up with that. And each work group will plan their own schedule. So they will plan based on the people that are in the work group and when they can meet. Once they get all their information together, it will be submitted and reviewed during the months of June and July, and it will be put into a draft strategic plan document. That document will be shared with participants as well as Academic Senate in August of 2021, and we will be looking to bring it to the Board of Trustees for a first read in September and for approval in October. So all of this information with respect to the schedule will be provided through an operations email. So, and it, you will also receive reminders of all of the meetings that are available for you to join and lend your uh, support and ideas about what you think the college should look like in the future and your ideas about how you can, how you can shape that future. So that's really important. And I guess I'll also just say that the process is really meant to be collaborative. And so I highly encourage people to participate in whatever way that you can. In closing, just really thank you for your time. We will have a panel discussion later. And so any questions that you have about strategic planning at the college, we welcome those questions. Also, if you don't feel like you want to ask a question publicly, you can send your questions to strategicplan at lcc.edu, or you can send it directly to me at Samuel, S-A-M-U-E-L-S, at lcc.edu. So thank you so much. I'm excited about the strategic planning process, and I'm excited about really approaching our strategic plan from a strategic point of view and really looking at what's happening in our environment and addressing those things and addressing how we can shape our future of LCC, making sure that we keep those things in mind, but we have a plan to be um, successful, that we have a plan to, to do more and be a leader in the higher education field. So thank you so much. Thank you 
so much, Dr. Samuel. Um, that was fantastic. I've been uh, getting some questions about whether or not we could be able to have access to your slides. But so we can talk about that after, but I just, I, I'm saying it out loud so everybody knows that we'll, we'll work on it. <laughs> okay. Um, also, I want to apologize because it uh, apparently my volume on my microphone was up very high and people were telling me stop screaming. So <laughs> anyway, um, I turned it down. I hope y'all can still hear me. So thank you, Dr. Samuel. Uh, I think it's, you know, really fascinating how much work goes into um, strategic operational planning. Um, okay, so it's 10 o'clock. Um, we're still gonna take a short break. Um, Dr. Bailey will be next. I will introduce her in just a few minutes um, to keep us on track. Well, still, I think, Three, a three minute break, is that good for everybody? Get up, take your bio break. Um, and then we'll, we'll, I will introduce Dr. Bailey at 10.05. Okay, so see you back here at 10.05. Thanks everyone.
Okay, it's it's ten oh five, and um, I want to keep us on track. So uh, welcome back. We were just on a short break. For those of you just joining, um, so uh, that's the wrong slide. I'm sorry. That's okay. I was just gonna say, uh, Dr. Bailey, are you ready? Yeah, just give me a second here. Okay. While Patrick is um, getting Dr. Bailey's slides together, I uh, am very happy to be able to introduce our next speaker. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Tanya Bailey. Hi, Tanya. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> Nice to see you. I know we we talked on the phone earlier. Uh, yes. But always nice to see your smiling face. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna mute myself, and you're gonna take it from here. Thank you, Dr. Tanya Bailey. Thank you so much, and good morning, LCC. I am so excited. Uh, to be with you um, and to be invited again. I first have to thank Megan Lynn, the entire CTE team, Anicia, Jim Luke, and everyone in CTE for constantly providing um, information, education, resources, and inspiration to our entire community. Thank you for what you do. You absolutely matter. Um, and then I also want to um, honor and thank uh, Dr. Robinson for his leadership um, and his amazing remarks and always, always um, courageous uh, leadership that he provides our college and so thankful that he is with us to all of my ELT colleagues um, and kudos to Dr. Samuel for such a fantastic presentation and to Provost Welch and other ELT, ELT members that I can't see right now. So, <laughs> uh, and to uh, last but not least to our amazing um, faculty and staff, uh, as Dr. Robinson shared in his opening remarks, um, faculty and staff, you have uh, become uh, some of my personal heroes. Um, like with our health professions that have been dealing with this um, coronavirus, you have um, been able to transition our students teaching and learning uh, in a very fast way, and you've done it um, with great excellence and your work has not gone unnoticed. And I just want to say thank you for helping our students during this polydemic. I also like Dr. Robinson and Dr. Samuels want to echo the sentiments about the work of our police and public safety and all of our amazing team uh, within our facilities division and other division, our student affairs that have been so amazing working with students um, in lieu of us being in these beautiful virtual boxes. So I just wanna let you know that all of you matter. Um, and if I did not call out your name, if you could just hashtag yourself in the chat, <laughs> hashtag yourself, hashtag your name. I want you to know that you are a, a hero and a change agent and I celebrate every ounce of the work that you give to this amazing institution. I want to talk today about um, our plans forward, as you have probably been attuned and a student and first row seats to our equity action plan presentations to the Board of Trustees. Um, today, I will be focusing on how we carry out that plan forward with a campaign that we are calling through the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Let's Get working. And so thank you, Patrick, for being amazing as you are and helping me with the slides today. If you can progress to the next slide, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay. I want everybody just to take a moment and allow this graphic to take you back to June of 2020. Now, I know we're in a new year, but I think in order for us to progress forward, we have to acknowledge where we have been just in these short few moments and months. This picture reminds us that our nation, our world needs our help. Our students, 
our communities. The death of George Floyd and countless others in 2020 alone has caused our nation to pause, it's caused us to take more value in human lives, and it's caused us also to recognize the importance of togetherness and how anything can happen if we work together. This obviously was the sentiment and the thoughts of our board of trustees here at LCC, who also was moved with compassion and determination to make a clear statement about how LCC will respond to the variety of racial injustices, not to mention to the unprecedented disparities that has resulted due to the coronavirus, particularly in our underserved communities and populations. As you hopefully are able to stare and glaze at this graphic, I'm hoping that it doesn't cause sadness, but yet motivation. As you look upon the faces that are covered in masks because we're in a new time, as you look upon the diversity that is in this graphic and the fading of hundreds and hundreds of individuals who are gathering together in various cities, town halls, virtual rooms to say that enough is enough and an end to racism is not yesterday, but now. Next slide. Dr. King once said, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. And I believe his words are a part of the work that we do here as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion for LCC and the work we do period on behalf of our students and this community. It is also these words that is poignant and driving to the Let's Get Working campaign, which I'll be speaking on today. Next slide. Our board resolution to address racial injustice, which ultimately to speak on and have a plan of action regarding racism and other areas came out in June of June 15th, actually, of 2020. A very brave statement, but embedded inside of it was an equity action plan. Next slide. It wasn't just rhetoric, but as an actual plan to lead us forward on how we as a college could create change and address the issues outlined in the resolution such that all lives would feel as if they matter because they do. Next slide. There are five key action areas as a reminder that the Board of Trustees resolution pointed out. Overall, it called for equity to be in action as it relates to racial injustice college-wide. It also called for the embedding of diversity equity and inclusion. And as I go forward in this presentation, I might refer to those three um, important entities as DEI to embed those things in all the work that we do, to have guided DEI expectations in our hiring practices and orientations, to establish a systematic level of change, and obviously to have equity in our police and public safety. This Let's Get Working campaign is focused on those three areas, diversity of people's perspective, equity in the policies, practices, and the positions and procedures that we have, and most certainly inclusion, making sure that everyone has a voice and that there is an organizational culture of inclusivity in all that we do. Our campaign is created, will be led by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion but definitely we won't be the only one leading the cause. It's a campaign aimed to break down barriers for students, but also staff and even faculty 
that will cause them to have a barrier in completing degrees or having inclusive learning experience or advancing in their educational pursuits. It definitely is designed to be a part, as Selena, uh, Dr. Samuels just mentioned, of our strategic plan that will ensure every facet of our college has diversity, equity, and inclusion embedded in its priorities. Next slide, please. So a strategic plan for diversity, equity, inclusion has to be explicit and it definitely has to be integrated. It has to be something that's college-wide, not siloed, but definitely approach where inclusion and diversity is respected and is the norm. To do that, we have to develop a common language and focus on diversity, equity, inclusion. On the website of our office, there are definitions that we are using for this work and we'll be using even through our strategic plans. It also requires a culture that I like to call of ACTS, A-C-T-S. Go ahead, put that in the chat as well. The A stands for accountability. The C stands for community. The T is for transparency and the S is for scholarship, particularly on issues of DEI. The Let's Get Working campaign is designed to engage everyone and to cause us to have collective responsibility for DEI. While I am the Chief Diversity Officer here at LCC, it is also being knighted upon all of you today to join me in this work and to continue for those that have already been doing the work to ensure that this is not just one person's job, but it's our collective responsibility. Next slide. So transformational initiatives related to diversity, equity, and inclusion are fundamental as they actually create a foundation for an inclusive organizational culture. That means that there'll be transparency in the work that we do. That means that we are aiming at raising awareness that in turns create action. We are also in this campaign aiming to inspire as well as engage every member of our LCC community. Building conscious coalitions and having tough conversations about specific topics that either have been ignored or not fully unpacked. Ultimately, as mentioned before, our path forward is to embed diversity, equity, and inclusion into every facet of our business, our practices, and the students that we prepare to lead this world. Next slide. So how are we gonna do this? Glad you asked. There'll be five focus areas that emerge coming from our equity action plan that we will address through the Let's Get Working campaign. The first one that I like to take time to talk about is building for equity. This will involve designing inclusive, sociable, equitable learning environments, as well as workspaces where everyone can thrive. And that does include those with various, various disabilities. LCC has done an amazing job um, providing um, accessibility as a priority for all. And this plan, along with our strategic plans uh, moving forward, will also ensure that this is a priority for us going forward. The second one is to address establishing a sense of belonging. Everyone has had an experience at some point of not being included. Sense of belonging, according to research, is vital to the success, not only of our students, but also of our employees. It is with these intentional efforts that we intend to promote a climate of belonging where everyone feels welcome, safe, and respected, especially our trans community and those who have come from marginalized or disadvantaged backgrounds. In our third focus area for this campaign, we will be addressing confronting bias and increasing cultural competence. There will be a series of creations of DEI trainings, workshops, train the trainer opportunities, 
and an additional means to educate our college community, as well as promote and celebrate the differences that we have. Our fourth focus area really looks at how we can create community conscious coalitions. These are establishing supportive allies and building teams that can change or create change between students, faculty, and staff. I will be talking about today the launch of the Equity Educators for Inclusion. That will be key in every department and unit of the college, including enlisting our students as well as other employees to serve as diversity champions. I know you're excited about that and can't wait to sign up. So hold on to your seat. Our fifth area is to address transforming and reimagining our future as a college and as a leader in education. This will be infused as you just heard through the previous presentation that diversity, equity, inclusion is now a key pillar or focus area in our strategic plan for the next several years. And I also want to note that through transforming and really reimagining our future is going to involve us using data-driven metrics and a whole lot of planning by the we, not the me. Next slide. So let's talk a moment about the equity educators for inclusion. How will my department or unit get working on DEI? I'm so glad you asked because I feel like I'm this lady in the picture here as well. Next slide. We're gonna be able to use full-time faculty as well as part-time faculty and staff members who avail themselves to serve as a point of contact for diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in every unit and department of the college. Those individuals that can be self-selected and all obviously approved by their supervisor and their unit uh, will be able to report directly to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion on the progress and work that they are making. They'll assist their department in leading the planning for these efforts, coordinating, as well as implementing all DEI-related activities, as well as policy and procedure changes. They'll share their best practices at various points throughout our calendar year, and they'll also serve as an additional resource for the department and be able to include all of the activities that they are doing to improve and embed DEI in their work. Ultimately, our Equity Educators for Inclusions, or ELIs as I like to call them, will serve as a, link with, a linkage between the department and the overall college-wide efforts to work with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Are you ready to sign up? You can email me now. We'll talk more about this in our next slide. One of the resources that the ELIs will have and that will be shared with every department as well as their leadership will look like, uh, will look like this uh, equity working plan or let's get working action plan template. You'll recall that one of our focus areas was to establish a sense of belonging, as I just mentioned before. So a key area under that is to create inclusive and welcome environments for all. Here is a template and a sample of that. For example, a sample uh, tactic might be to develop and unveil a diversity wall, and this can be done virtually. It could chronologically highlight significant events of LCC's history, doing the great work that they have done in diversity, and also showcasing what they will do in the future. But how will we measure it? We will use um, the, a number of event in individuals that participated in the design and implementation. We will also look at the location where that will be, if it's virtual or on a website. We'll measure it also by the number of uh, individuals who actually see it and are impacted by it. Other resources to be used are designed here to look at the time of development. Is there gonna be cost involved? Who will actually lead it from that department? And what's our time frame? Eventually, upon these activities and plans, the ELI of every department will be reporting that activity and progress back to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, all while using the support and help from our data science team, as well as other 
DEI metrics to help in this process so that we can measure as well as be transparent in our work. Next slide. Utilizing two key frameworks is a part of this process. The first is the APEDI, or Action Planning for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. It's used all across the country as a roadmap to leading for excellent planning outcomes in this work. It's also going to be used to help every department and unit that aligns itself to the campaign to make sure that our chosen methods are ideal, as well as the Six Dimensions Worldwide Intelligence Framework, which actually provides all individuals involved in this process a worldwide view of how we can make change, not only at LCC, but in our world. Next slide. So I see us having an opportunity, an opportunity utilizing the Let's Get Working campaign to showcase the events. How we do that? We can ask within our department how we're gonna measure our workplace diversity and inclusiveness. How are we looking at our employee demographics and sense of belonging? We'll look at patterns and trends, lessons learned, and how we can be a leader, a national leader in this work. We'll also address structures and behaviors that are not in line with the goals or the posture that the college has for DEI. And then obviously, we will look at mental models and worldviews on how we can create systemic and long-lasting success for our students and our employees. Next slide. All of this will be documented in our Let's Get Working landing page, which is underway as I speak. It will highlight all of the five key, key areas and it will be a public space where our LCC community and external community can log on to see all of the great work that all of you will be doing. They'll be able to find resources as well as best practice tips on how to move the needle forward as it relates to DEI, whether they are faculty, staff, or student. Next slide. Our layout for our landing page will be engaging and interactive. There'll be videos and hopefully some of you will even get engaged in some TikTok videos that we'll be producing that further help to support and showcase the promotion of inclusiveness and why everyone is valued and important here at LCC. It'll also highlight the number of initiatives that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion is sponsoring to continue this work, as well as provide updates on what other colleagues around the campus is doing and around the college-wide community. Next slide. Some of those initiatives will obviously call for you, as well as the students that you teach and the students that you serve to get involved. There'll be numerous points of contact for involvement, and I, like you, hope that we can start today in moving this process forward and getting your support. Next slide. Our differences make us stronger. I'll say it again. Our differences make us stronger. This comprehensive Let's Get Working campaign will be launching this spring, and it reflects our approach to ensuring that LCC is diverse, equitable, and an inclusive place for all. There are several areas to DEI that we hope to achieve by outlining and, and embedding this program into all that we do at LCC. It'll give us an opportunity for greater learning and greater dialogue, particularly as it relates to DEI. It'll help us better measure our progress as well as strengthen our LCC community one to another. It will give us the ability to be accountable and reward the successes that we have made. It'll cause us to have an opportunity to build safe and supportive physical environments as well as mental workspaces for all. Giving us diversity in our leadership, in our faculty and staff, teaching and providing equitable solutions is all a part of this plan. And obviously providing a numerous amount of support resources as well as engaging in VIX and activities that will leave a long lasting impact to not only change LCC for the better, but the world that we sit ourselves in. Next slide. I started off with a quote 
from Dr. King, but I just couldn't leave it at one. He also said that the first step in faith is that we don't see the whole staircase. However, we do have to take the first step. And that's what I'm inviting all of you to do with me today is take the first step. Maybe DEI is not something you're familiar with, but this is a new year and a new opportunity for all of us to take the first step. Maybe you've been engaged in this process for a long time and you have long for the opportunity to see it college-wide. Well, let's keep pushing and let's keep doing more. Next slide. Because with all of us together, teamwork really does make the dream work. And so I'm inviting all of you to let's get working. Thank you. Dr. Bailey, thank you so much. I imagine uh, folks will be asking if we can also have these slides so we can arrange that later. Um, so, so thankful um, for the work that you're doing here and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, always happy to see you. So thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, okay, we are, we're still pretty much on schedule. Fantastic. Um, let's take a few minute break. Um, our next and last keynote speaker this morning is, uh, I'll introduce her again, um, uh, Dr. Sally Welch, our provost, but I want us to have a moment to stand up. Um, so let's just take three minutes, all right, and we'll, we will digest Dr. Bailey's, um, presentation while we have a short bio break and let's uh, start our next um, presentation at 1035. I know it's only three minutes, so get up and jump around for a minute, everybody, and we'll see you in three minutes. All right.
I know that was a really short break. <laughs> um, are we, uh, Dr. Welch, are we ready? Okay, cool. So um, for our final keynote speaker this morning, um, I am very happy to introduce my boss, <laughs> the big boss. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm really happy and thankful to have our provost, Dr. Sally Welch, here with us. Um, she's got a presentation uh, about the academic master plan, which I don't hear that term so frequently. So um, without further ado, let's hear it from you, Dr. Welch. I'm going to mute myself. Thank you so much um, for joining us. Somebody's phone is ringing. I don't know. <laughs> it's yours. Okay. Okay. That's what I thought, maybe. All right. So we're really, really happy to have you here. Um, and I'm handing it off to you, Dr. Sally Welch, our LCC Provost. Good morning, and thank you for having me here today. So I'm on the do not call list, and you can see that it doesn't work. I get spam calls all the day, all the time. So good morning, happy new year. Thank you everyone for the invitation to participate in the panel today. And before I start my presentation, I'd like to take just a moment to publicly thank everyone again for the amazing work over the last nine months to help each other and our students. You've done an incredible job. Talk about a resilient community and campus. It's going to be a really exciting year this year with all the creation and implementation of a number of plans. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about academic master planning. And as Megan said, you may not be familiar with this type of plan. Our last plan was in 2011. So for this reason, I thought I'd just give a little bit of an introduction to it. And this is gonna be um, an extension of the wonderful presentation that Dr. Samuels has given us already. So just a little bit more detail. And thank you to Patrick. He taught me a new thing today where you can actually put the PowerPoint in the WebEx instead of sharing your screen. So I'm excited to try it. So for the academic master plan, it's really important that this is our vision of where we wanna go with our academics and all the areas that support the academics. So it's both teaching and non-teaching area. We want it to be aspirational. So it's just like the strategic plan. It, it's something that we want to achieve, that we want to reach. And what it will do is help us prioritize resources and budgeting. It's important to understand it's a living document the same as the strategic plan. Things will change in the middle of it. We'll learn things work or things don't work and we'll need to adjust to reevaluate and come up with new ideas to work through. It helps us to set up measures for success. We wanna be able to always benchmark our work and show that we're making accomplishments as we go forward. And what it's really helpful to do is give us um, prioritization in over in budget, curriculum development, technology use, anything else that comes up. Having a plan, as Chris McCurzy, the executive director of facilities, tells me all the time, having a plan will help him do the campus master plan. So having an academic plan, a vision of where we wanna go, will help the college do the rest of the work. The plan also provides really important for the campus master plan, it provides us an idea of how to use the space. So there are open spaces within the campus. How do we want to best use them? Um, again, as Chris McCursey always talks about, we want to, to design a space once. We don't want to have to keep redesigning a space. So we want to think through carefully, how do we use the space in the HHS building? How do we use the open space in tech careers? How do we make those prized places for our students to come to? Oops, sorry, part hit the wrong button. And again, I wanna connect this to what Dr. Samuels talked about earlier. So the academic master plan flows from the strategic plan. And from there, we developed 
the campus master plan. We develop a grant strategy. What funds and grants do we want to go after? And then a federal agenda. And those that don't know what a federal agenda is, very briefly, it's what we take to Congress every year to say, these are things that we're working on that we think you would be interested in funding. Um, currently, our federal agenda is looking at cybersecurity and apprenticeships. So when we're developing these plans, we want to make sure that we focus on a couple key factors. As I like to use the word retrosynthesis, we want to begin with the end in mind. So we want to begin with what is our vision of the campus three to five years from now? What do we want our space to look like? And then how do we get there? So it's a roadmap on how to get there. We need to understand what are our goals both academically and non-academic teaching space, non-academic for our teaching space. And then how do we look at programming, repurposing space, and other resources that are needed to make these goals? And probably the most important thing is that if it's not in this plan, it doesn't mean the work that is going on is not important. It just means that it's not part of the plan. It'll still be supported and it won't be eliminated. And what I wanted to share with you right now is as we think about the academic master plan, there's a number of questions that we have to consider in developing the plan. And they're important questions that you have to think about. So what programs do we need to have three to five years out to meet the industry and business needs in our region? And if we don't do this, will this change who comes to our campus? What spaces do those new programs need? Where do we want to be? What's going to make us distinctive? What's going to make us competitive in the future? Dr. Samuel talked about that in the strategic planning process. So as you can see, there's a continuing theme between strategic planning and academic master planning. What types of students do we want to attract to the campus? What do we want our students to know when they graduate? And what happens if we don't make any of these changes? Where will we be in five or 10 years? Sorry, keep hitting the wrong button. Give me a second here. Even with glasses, they're tiny buttons on the side. Again, what kind of questions, what kind of students and faculty do we want to attract and keep here? That's the important part. Once we've attracted them here, how do we retain them? What are the best ways to engage students, faculty, and administrators? How do we measure success? So again, where do we want to go? Who do we want to be? And how do we get there? That's all going to be in the academic master plan. And as Dr. Bailey would say, your question now is, how are we going to do this work? Well, very tentatively, I put up a schedule together. We have to create a task force. We need to review that task force. We'll review plans out there. And if you're curious, you can Google academic master plans for community colleges, and there's a number of examples out there that you can look at so you can see what a plan looks like. Um, when you do the Google search, also notice that there's a lot of schools that use the academic master plan as their strategic plan. So there's a lot of um, synergy between them. Once we have figured out um, what we want to do for our plan, we're going to create data packets and a questionnaire to send out to the program because we need the faculty's input in creating this plan. We need to know where the faculty and the program directors want to go with programs. We'll collect that information, we'll create a plan, we'll send it back out for feedback, and then we'll finalize the plan. And the hope is to have that for January of 2022. And this last um, slide for me is just to kind of put all of the pieces together. So my message to the community for Christmas, I talked a little bit about how I like to do puzzles. And so how my brain works is I like to kind of move things around until I figure out how they can align together. 
So we have a strategic plan. We have an academic master plan. Dr. Bailey just talked about let's get working. We also have achieving the dream. And so there's a lot of things that are going on right now. So how do we make them comprehensive and synergistic? Because we don't want individual plans that are sitting out there. So we want one plan to flow into the next so that it's cohesive and that we're doing similar projects for all of the plans and not new ones. So I thought putting just a little bit of a timeline up here would be helpful to you. And that know that these are all living documents and they'll be renewed, refreshed or redesigned once they're completed and that we'll continue this process going forward. So I think I got us back on schedule. So I'd like to thank everybody for the time today. And I really can't wait to see everybody in the spring, hopefully spring. I'm looking forward to it. And I'd like to say this ends the formal portion of our press panel discussion. We're gonna have a short break and then we're gonna open up the session for question and answer period. So Megan. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, probably we'll, we'll love to have your slides too. I say probably, we would love to have your slides too. Um, I just took a picture of that last slide so I could <laughs> look at it more for longer. Um, thank you, I, I, I love the idea of uh, not having lots of separate plans and I love to see how they all fit together synergistically. So thank you so much for that, Dr. Welch. Thanks for your presentation. Thanks for getting us back on track time-wise. <laughs> um, we will, uh, wow, yeah, we're like, we have time for a break. <laughs> Thank you. So um, as Dr. Welch just said, there will be a Q&A um, with our four keynote speakers. Um, and so if you, we're gonna take a break, but let me just say this first. Um, if you would be so kind as to type your question in the chat, and will you please um, note who your question is for? I, I'm gonna read the questions and try and moderate. We'll all be able to see the questions in the chat, but that can get like crazy, you know, not knowing who's gonna answer and who's gonna ask. So I will read questions out loud. Um, we have a half an hour. Um, I know sometimes questions could take all day, but we're not gonna do that all day. So um, we'll, we'll get as many answered as we can. So as I said, um, type who your question is for in the chat and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. I'll be reading the questions out loud. Um, okay, but for now, let's take a break until our planned time, 10.55. Okay, so meet us right back here at 10.55. Thanks everyone.
Welcome back. I was uh, just reading all of the nice comments in the chat. <laughs> um, yeah, really, uh, you guys are um, thanking me for doing something about the whole YouTube thing, but I didn't, I really was just sitting here. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but definitely there were people, as you said, Karen, Patrick, Anisia, and I don't even know who else. So thank you for um, being so fast. Um, I, I know I, I took a peek at my email a minute ago and um, I was, I just made a, a statement that I copied and pasted, you know, and I was trying to reply back to like 50 people. I can't get in the meeting. So um, it seems like people were, uh, people are either here or they're watching it from YouTube. So thank you. Thank you for all of that fast work. Um, okay. So um, initially we thought that we were going to have people email questions, but now we're not. We're just typing them in the chat. Um, and we're going to get started with that. So um, I might have to put my glasses on. Oh, I can't read this tiny print. Um, thank you for all the thank yous. <laughs> um, okay, so we're, I'm, I'm sorry, just give me a moment to uh, get a little bit organized. Um, Anisia and I are having some Skype conversation. We were going to try and organize questions, but you know what? I think we're just going to. Okay, here are some questions so far. Um, and I know they're going to keep rolling in, so we're doing our best. The first question is going to be for Dr. Welch. Who will be on the task force? That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Right now, tentatively, I have planned the provost cabinet members, faculty, and looking at three to five faculty members with a majority being senators and having divisional representation. Um, someone from student affairs advisor or uh, success coach to get the student perspective. We will have someone from uh, Center for Data Science, someone from Continuing Education or BCI, someone from facilities, and finally someone from budget. And how I kind of set up groups is I like to start <coughs> small and figure out what resources we need and then build out from there so that we can have a cohesive um, thought process as we go through it. And someone, Megan, in the chat asked if we're monitoring the YouTube chat as well. I don't know if you guys can do that. We are. Here. Um, yeah. yeah. We can. They are, and that is why. Um, so, Anisia is Skyping questions to me. <laughs> Look, she's looking at both chats. I didn't know I, I could multitask, but. <laughs> And I, I still don't know if I can, but I'm trying. Um, so that's why you may see a question or you may hear a question that's not in this chat. Um, so they're being Skyped to me. Um, thank you, Sally. Um, I'm going to ask the next question, um, which is, um, and this is I, I, for the whole panel, it says for ELT, are there financial implications? Is there someone who can address budget and vision? I'm very excited to hear about this process. Um, I'm wondering if there has been any thought about unfur unfurloughing furloughed faculty to bring them back as diversity educators. I know that was long. So <laughs> are we going to unfurlough furloughed faculty? Um, Anybody just jump in. That's that's just a for anybody question. Financial implications about budget and vision. Well, I think I could start. I mean, there may be some uh, specific answers that other members of our of our team would jump in on. Certainly, all the budget 
implications of the planning that we've talked about this morning have been taken into consideration in the in the revised budget. As regards furloughs, we were really uh, pleased to work with our uh, with, with all of our unions at extending the furlough ar arrangements that uh, preserve employment and benefits for folks going forward because those those agreements were set to expire. Um, perhaps Provost Welch could weigh in specifically on on faculty. The 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 furlough has has uh, been a, a mechanism that we've used to address the issue of folks who can't perform their work because of the pandemic. That has been largely a safety protocol issue and not a financial protocol. That would be my big picture answer. Provost Welch, anybody else on our team have a have a more specific granular aspect to the budgetary uh, question? It was a great question. I don't think I could add more about the, the furlough piece. It's, it's we used a metric of being able to do 75% of your work um, remotely. And if you couldn't, that's where we had to, to unfortunately furlough some people. I know the list is pretty small of the people we had to furlough. And as we move back to campus, we'll be able to bring people back. Um, I know with all of the plans that we're doing, we have to put funding towards them. And so I see the chief financial officer is at the top of my screen now. So I don't know if he wants to talk about it, but I do know that there's a, a portion of money that's already set aside for let's get working. There's already been a commitment to hire some staff for the let's get working piece. And as we do achieving the dream, we've already set some money aside to, um, be able to join the organization and figure out what components. I imagine each of the plans as we put them together, and tr again, I'm, I'm trying to do cohesive as we put them together, that we'll have funding for everything. Sally, can you hear me? Yeah, as far as the financial impact, um, obviously this year has been anything but usual, um, but in the amended budget that the board approved in December, there were significant funds uh, included for the equity action plan and other uh, diversity and inclusion activities. So um, obviously the things that have been discussed right now in this meeting, will be very important as we develop the FY22 budget. I know some of you think that's far away, but it's not. Uh, it's right on our doorstep. We'll be starting that process um, between the third and fourth week of January. So um, there will be a lot of effort put towards uh, being able to fund those activities that have been talked about this morning for the next fiscal year. Thank you, uh, Dr. Robinson and Dr. Welch. Um, okay, next question. Uh, this is for Dr. Robinson. What role is LCC playing in vaccinating students and faculty for COVID-19? Uh, thank you. Uh, and I think that question is from Kabir. It's a timely question. The governor's speaking on this today. Um, I can give a broad answer, and then there might be folks who have more specific uh, information uh, on our team, you know, particularly Dr. Samuel. So the governor's talking about this, and there's a three uh, sort of phase plan in Michigan, 1A, 1B, 1C. We got a great update from the Michigan Community College Association. There's still a, a lack of clarity about where community colleges fall in that layout. Uh, we're not in 1A. Uh, we are probably behind K-12 as the, as the question uh, 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 in the chat came up. Uh, but our team has already been talking about what role we would play, including HHS would play in the logistics and actually even the administration of vaccines. So anybody on the team have more of an update since our last uh, incident command and ELT meeting at the end of the year about where we are in participating with vaccinations? 
Hi, Dr. Robinson. Um, this is Selena. Great. I will just add to what you said that that's correct. HHS, as well as our administrative services team members, specifically Carol Wolfinger, our director of emergency management, she is working with HHS and other local health authorities to figure out what LCC will be able to do. We have been asked to participate in sort of a pod process where we may be able to be a site for our employees and students to receive the vaccination. But as Dr. Robinson mentioned, some of those details are yet to be hashed out. So we continue to have conversations. The last meeting that we had took place, I believe in December, late December. And there were so many questions that we had um, that more information is needed before we can give a full report to the college as to what we're going to do. But right now we know that MD, HHS, and local health departments are the ones that are helping us and they're the ones that's putting the pod plan together. And so we will work with them. We'll have our questions. We have a team that includes uh, Carol Wolfinger, members from our HHS, members from our purchasing department, because there's some logistical aspects to it. And it's a little early to say exactly what it's gonna look like, but rest assured, we are in those conversations and there is an opportunity for us to be involved with the distribution of vaccines to our employees and students. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Samuel. The one thing I would add is that throughout all of the COVID activity that Dr. Samuel's mentioning, and this has been an active topic uh, since we knew vaccines were coming out, um, We've been really mindful of the communications process. And when we meet on these things, um, uh, Karen Tomasulo, Marilyn Twine, everybody is working hard to make sure that we are communicating out. So when we do have information for the campus community, uh, we will be uh, uh, pushing it out. So it's an excellent question. Something we're all very excited about because it's an important tactic for us to get back uh, to face to face. Thanks everyone for all of that information. Okay, um, the next question, this is also initially to Dr. Robinson. Um, Lansing Community College has many initiatives such as those described by Dr. Bailey and Dr. Robinson. How is LCC going to enhance its core mission of providing a quality education above all else? I, I love this question and thank you so much, Simon, for asking it. I, I'd like to give a preliminary answer and see if uh, other members of the team would like to enhance it. One of the things, one of the very early decisions we made about the strategic planning refresh process is that we wouldn't be revisiting the college's mission, motto, or vision. To me, the core of your question about providing quality education as our primary mission that's not changing. Uh, the things that we are adding actually uh, are gonna enhance our ability to make sure that more people or folks who are not uh, benefiting as much as others have access to that excellence. Um, quality, affordable pathways to transfer and, and great careers is what we've been doing since we were formed. So I'm glad you asked the question it's going to be at the front and center of, of everything that we do. And in my view, the things that we're doing to enhance being more strategic, adding diversity, equity, and inclusion, re rejoining, achieving the dream, they are all done with the purpose of elevating our emphasis on, on quality classroom, quality teaching and learning. Anybody have anything to add? It's a great question. I would just add that the strategic plan has a focus area for student success, and it's obviously something that we're focused on throughout the process. But then also, I think the biggest thing is that working on an academic master plan is gonna be really important. And I know that Dr. Welch is also working on an online learning plan that she can speak to. And I think all those things together, along with achieving the dream, I think they really show that academics is at the heart of what we do and we're doing our best to make sure that we're continuously improving and that we're always thinking about the needs of the students, not just from you know what they need in the classroom, but also what they need as it relates to support services. So that was a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. 
Dr. Wells, do you want to say anything about the online uh, learning plan? <laughs> sure. If I could get my mute button to work. I am having technology challenges over here. And I'll just let you know, I'm probably going to get another call, phone call soon. The do not call thing usually is in a pattern of every half an hour, so I should be getting another one pretty quickly. Um, the online strategic, online learning strategic plan is really designed at how do we become the best online provider? So we talked about aspirational goals before. We do a really good job. We have an excellent e-learning team that helps to guide our faculty and to show them how to use the tools. Now, how do we take it that next step and make sure that we provide the best education for experience for our students? How do we draw people to come here? There are a lot of great online providers out there right now. How do we get into that market? Um, we're part of what we call SARA, which is the State Authorization Reciprocity Act, which allows us actually to provide education to people outside of Michigan. So how do we become a national figure in online education? And in terms of the process, I've been slowing the process down just a little bit so that we can get it in sync with the strategic planning process and the academic master plan. So I'm, I'm trying to just delay it a little bit. Um, we have two teams that are working on it right now, and I've invited both teams to participate in some HLC online consortium workshops that are coming up, and hopefully that'll provide some other information. Um, I've been told that we probably are already doing everything that are in those workshops. I'm hoping that we'll get some extra information and some clues and some things that will, will help us with our students. So. Um, hopefully that's a good enough of an answer. I can go into more detail if anybody has any questions. This is Tanya. I just wanted to also add to that and thank um, thank you for the question. I think when we talk about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is all about um, the core mission at LCC. And as Dr. Robinson shared, it enhances everything. Um, it actually brings it further to the forefront. Um, an example of this is like with our RISE Institute, which recently won uh, the Equity in Education Award at the end of last year, um, because our focus is to equip, support, and help our faculty uh, such that they are able to translate their skills to help our students, which ultimately helps our society. And so all of the initiatives that I've mentioned and that are um, ramping up focuses around our core mission um, and does not deviate from that, but definitely enhance it, or I like to say, amps it up, amplifies it. So thank you for the question. Thank you all, thank you all for all of your great answers. Um, I, sorry, I'm, I was getting, people were emailing me a question. I, I, I did see, uh, I'm sorry, I'm switching back from Skype to email. Um, okay, so the next question, um, I, I guess this is for the whole panel. Uh, with a more open enrollment and numbers of students with special learning needs in some cases, will this population be a part of diversity and inclusion? Tanya, it sounds like this one is more for you. <laughs> or will information for this be more under student access? So I get, yeah, if you want me to, it, the question is in the chat, if you want to take a peek. Yes, I'm, I'm looking at it and okay. thank you for the, for the question. Um, uh, Pat, I believe it's, it's not an and or, it's, it's all of the above. Um, obviously, when we talk about uh, diversity and inclusion, um, when it relates to special populations, including those that have uh, students with specialized learning needs, they have to be included. Um, excluding them would be an injustice. And so making sure that um, the work that we're doing um, in a variety of different areas through um, Sally's area and more, as well as Rhonda's area in student affairs, we're focusing on that. In fact, one of the uh, things that we are looking at doing is, is providing specialized programs and initiatives that address specialized populations as well as learners. 
to to ensure their success. Uh, and so I see it as an all, not an either or, but we're definitely focused on uh, learning disabilities and different learning styles um, and equipping our uh, faculty in order to assist those students. And I'll leave my colleagues to further add to that. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Does anyone want to add? Add anything? No, we're good. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. I have uh, this question was asked anonymously. Will we? And it wasn't asked for me. <laughs> but will we be able to continue working from home? Uh, I'll take that one, and I'd love our team to to add. Uh, short answer is yes. Okay. Um, uh, let me expand on it a little bit. Uh, you know, we've been monitoring very quickly, I'm uh, not very carefully what comes from the state and making sure that we are following the best example for mitigating the virus on campus. And a really important part of that is working at home. I have to tell you, I actually thought about whether I should come to campus because I could have participated from, from my home. Um, and I've been trying to model that to, 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 to be at home when I can. I think the biggest question will come is when we do get the virus under control, how much work from home do we continue to, to uh, 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 weave into our regular workflow? I think we're gonna have to work through that as a campus community. We're already thinking about it. Um, I'd say this is, is funny, but it's not, we need it. Uh, one component of working from home that will help us is with the ramp construction. Um, uh, Again, I'll, I'll make a little joke out of it. We, in addition to uh, having folks work from home, we, we probably will, would love to have a student park in your parking space. Uh, but um, on a more serious note, uh, I think the ent our entire culture is going to have to re-examine the role of, of, of work from home going forward. Uh, and I know there's a great diversity of feelings about that. Uh, many folks like me really miss their, um, their, their, their office environments. Um, but uh, that we're actively looking at all of that, and uh, I would just ask any other members of our team to maybe add add a layer of our current thinking. We're we're actively uh, exploring all that going forward. I, I can add just a little bit to that. We've had a number of conversations with different members of my team, uh, talking about the efficiency of being able to work at home versus on campus and the value of doing that. So I, I think we will be looking at a different model for the college kind of going forward in terms of working environment. And externally, I'm also hearing the same conversations happening. So it's how do we best position our employees to be successful and also help our students as we go through this. And I'll just add to that, that we've had the same conversation. So this it's kind of a college wide conversation. So I just want to make it clear that all parts of the college is, is really having this conversation because we know that it's something that we're going to need to address. And this question has come up more than once. So we appreciate the person for bringing it forward in this public forum. We definitely are looking at it. So we thank you all for the question. Thank you everyone for, for your answers uh, on that question. Um, uh, sorry, just checking a few places for other questions. Um, I, I see a question in the chat from Erica. Uh, along that line, now that you have canceled the accident fund parking agreement, will there be enough parking for faculty? Thank you for that question. Um, what I can say is that yes, we have been working with our public safety, specifically with Bill French, our chief of police, and he's our parking guru. And he has indicated that we have no issues with letting go of that particular lease agreement. It was going to end anyway in September of next year. Part of our entire parking plan, you know, with 
with uh, the demolition of the Gannon building parking ramp and rebuilding it is making sure that we have more parking. So we knew this was coming and the agreement was gonna end anyway in September of 2021. So yes, we've ended it some months early, but we fully believe that we'll be able to take care of the parking needs of faculty. So that's not something that I would worry about. And we'll also be able to take care of parking needs with students. We already have, um, agreements that we are working on with uh, the city of Lansing, if for some reason we would require additional parking, but at this time, there's no indication that we will. But thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. All right, here's another question. Um, and, and these are, it, it's not being specified about who they're for, so jump in if you have the answer. So here's the question. Are there updates on working with students who are not college ready or ELL related to diversity, equity, and inclusion or anything else? I, I will copy and paste that into the chat. Um, are there updates on working with students who are not college ready uh, or ELL in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I, I think qu quickly on, on the, um, the academic side, if I'm understanding the qu question correctly, we did bring back um, funding for Foundations for Success, so that will run in the spring term, and we also brought back funding for the non-credit um, ESOL courses, so those both will be running. Thank you, Dr. Welch. Uh, okay. If I, if I could, Megan, I would add two other layers to that important question. One is, and one of its very, uh, one answer I have is kind of uh, preliminary. I know that you know, our I team and some folks on campus are are thinking about ways to develop programming for for students who are differently abled or maybe on the autism spectrum. And there are a lot. There's a lot of great, innovative work being done in higher ed in, in dealing uh, with different student populations that maybe we haven't uh, dealt with. I also want to react to what Martine put in the chat. I really like that idea. She said that maybe maybe it's not that the students aren't college ready, but our college isn't student ready. Um, so we could spend some time thinking about how we're ready for students who come to us with different abilities. And then referring back to Dr. Bailey's excellent presentation, we wholeheartedly see uh, this ability spectrum as part of our, our DEI um, uh, issue uh, and initiatives. And so when we think about embracing folks who come at us from lots of different perspectives, that that's something that we are very intentional about. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. I have another question unless someone has something to add. Okay, the next question is, uh, when campus learning continues, Will there still be the option of ORT courses? So the option for online real time or synchronous courses? Excellent question. And I would say yes. I think if they're successful in helping students um, learn in an online environment that we should continue. Um, we don't have any data yet to, to show whether synchronous or asynchronous is working better. But there's also an option coming. Part of ORT is that we could actually do multi-campus um, classes. We have something called lecture capture, which allows a faculty in a class to be student class of students to be in one room, but then also broadcasted to East, West, or Livingston campus. So I, I think there's some really good options moving forward with this. And I, I'm ex pretty excited for the faculty who have taken this. I've heard some great feedback from students um, I, who have taken ORT classes and have really enjoyed it. So I'd like to see them continued. I'd like to see if they're effective. 
Thank you, Dr. Welch. Uh, okay, uh, here's another question for any for any and all. What aspects of the LCC culture, if any, must change if we are to succeed in our many college-wide initiatives? Megan, could you repeat it one more time for me? Sure. What aspects of the LCC culture, if any, must change if we are to succeed in our many college-wide initiatives? Thank you. And thank you to the person uh, who asked the question. Um, my initial reaction is our mindsets. Um, change, um, John Maxwell says, change is inevitable, but growth is optional. And I think as a college, we have to continue to choose to grow and want um, the culture to be inclusive uh, and want to make sure everyone is welcome, respected, and safe. Um, and that requires us to collectively have that mindset. Um, and so I, I, for me, it starts with that mindset uh, for all uh, of everyone seeing that it is important work uh, necessary work, and sorry to be um, new word quotatious <laughs> today, but my John Lewis voice is necessary trouble. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good necessary trouble, and so I think uh, it 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 really just starts with us having the the mindset, which I believe we are there, we are so there, and really beyond. The, the train has left the station. Um, but it starts there, being intentional and having the mindset to actually make the changes that's needed. Hopefully that answers it a little bit. And sorry for being quotatious. <laughs> Dr. Bailey, oh, I was gonna say, I appreciate your quotation, so thank you. Um, I would only add to what you said, that I think as we continue to recognize where we've had silos and we move out of those silos and we work collaboratively and see ourselves as a one team. So we have this culture of being one team and working collaboratively, excuse me, collaboratively to resolve issues. I think that's one of the things that we can do to address that question. So thank you for the question. And I think Dr. Robinson wanted to add. Um I do. And actually, uh, Dr. Samuel kind of, that was a great tee off to what I want to say. I agree with that completely. If I could put some of that in my own words, um, you know, I think in some ways we need to flatten our organization and, and do even more to communicate uh, across. It's maybe a, a, a tired uh, metaphor to say silos, but we all know what we're talking about when there aren't touch points or, or a kind of a matrixed approach to our work. I need to preface my answer to this question. It's why I didn't go first by saying that I'm still learning our culture. You know, I've been here five plus months. And so um, I, I've been quickly uh, learning and becoming part of our culture. And I meant it when, when I said in my remarks that I thank you for accepting me into the culture and, and, uh, and helping me be a part of it. So my, uh, Initial observations are kind of preliminary, and some of them have to do with higher ed in general. But one thing I would say, and I want to say it in a positive way, not a negative way, I, I do think that in higher ed in general and here at LCC, we do need to change a culture away from a pretty familiar us-them way of thinking about our work. It's really common in higher ed to be thinking of faculty, administration, or board and college staff. And um, it, some of those patterns came uh, very understandably from conflict or, or disagreements. I've been doing this for a long time at three different really great community colleges. Um, and, and I think we need to change over a period of years um, to, to move away from a us them. And so I, I hesitated saying that because it sounds kind of negative, but I do believe it's true. And to the extent that administrators can see things from a faculty perspective and vice versa, to the extent that uh, a board member can see things from the perspective of a faculty or a staff member, that's, that's a culture change I think we could aspire to. I'm also uh, not impatient about that. It's not going to happen overnight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Dr. Welch? I, just a 
quick comment in there. I thank my ELT members for their comments already. I think we're we we're as a team, I think, pretty one minded in terms of we want to be one team, all of us together. Um, I learned a phrase <clears throat> last year, maybe a year ago, um, lean in and be willing to lean in instead of leaning out. And I think that's something that we as an institution have to learn how to do too. Thank you, Dr. Welch. So um, there are a few more questions, um, but we are over our time limit. Uh, so I, if, if I can just stick one question in there, there are multi layers to this question, but let me just ask um, the short version, which is um, what is happening with exam proctoring? I don't know if I have an easy answer for this. I saw in the chat um, one of the, the faculty members talking about, we need to think differently about assessment. I understand the need for proctored exams, um, particularly for accredited programs, but that might not be the only solution that we need to have. There are different ways to do proctored exams instead of using the testing center, but we still are trying to explore it. Um, Matt Lemon has been working on this for over a year, trying to figure out what's the best way to do it. They've, he's got a great process, at least for placement testing and doing ACT. Right now, we're not ready to do full class loads through the testing center. So we need to think smartly about how do we do this? How do we make sure that students are learning the material that we're, we're trying to help them um, get engaged with? And are there different ways to look at how do we test them? So it, I, it's a great question. It is, and, that, and Dr. Welch gave a great LCC answer. What I'm about to say is not about LCC. So our folks who are doing online proctoring, I, I, that's not what I'm reacting to. I will tell you that if you monitor the higher ed press and discourse on this topic, one thing I think is really important for us to keep in mind is some of these proctoring uh, tools and some of the proctoring processes can be highly invasive for students. I think we have to be very mindful of that. Our students are going through a lot trying to do remote learning. And the last thing we would want to do is to traumatize or negatively impact them uh, uh, by having rigid or one size fit all uh, strategies for um, rigor and authentication. So. Uh, you don't have to look too far in the higher ed press to see some pretty negative stories about how proctoring tools uh, have created some pretty negative impact on students. And that's not who we are. We don't want to do that. Uh, we've got smart people in this area, so I know we'll uh, uh, approach it with an equity lens. But I just wanted to, to say that since the topic came up. Thank you. I'm just trying to type real fast and it's not working. Well said, Dr. Robinson. Yes. Ditto, ditto, ditto. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your answers. Um, I, I will say too, um, we just put something yesterday into our website. It's one of the asynchronous sessions. You'll see it, it's about camera use. Um, there are some ideas, uh, There, there's an article, um, about to give us more perspective about this um, and the privacy and equity issues that are related to the, you know, camera use. And there are some ideas for other things that we can do um, uh, instead of using cameras. So hopefully you can take a look at that today. Hey, you guys, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna end so people can have a little lunch break. This was fantastic. Thank you for everyone's uh, participation. Thanks for all of you who answered questions. Thank you for the ELT panel. Um, and, you know, I could just keep saying a million thank yous. Thanks for getting it up on YouTube. Um, and uh, so if you have any questions, Skype me or Skype Anisia.
Olivia Dillard and we'll be happy to, to help you. So I'll be seeing you later. <laughs> okay. Thanks everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Hey, Megan, it's Deb. How are you? Hi, Deb. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, just a quick question. Um, some of my staff are asking for um, if there's going to be a new link for the breakout sessions. So in each post, when you go to the website, uh -huh. in each breakout session post, uh, there is a, a link for each session. So now we, we, there are separate WebEx meetings for all of the concurrent sessions. You know what I mean? Yeah, but some of my people are on the YouTube. Will it still work? Oh, no, it, no. nope. Now it, uh, this morning session is over. Yeah. Okay. Um, the breakout sessions will start at 1205. But we shouldn't have that overload problem with the breakout sessions because there are several. And those, so each breakout session has its own WebEx link. It'll be its own separate meeting. Right. So, so it's not going to be like one group and then we break out using the breakout feature. It's actually separate WebEx meetings. So we shouldn't have the overload problem again. Right. Okay. I'll let them know. Okay, and also there's a, a printable schedule on the website. Um, you can click on the title, or, and there's also the WebEx links for each section. If you're if you're more of a like, I need to look at this on paper person. Gotcha. Um, okay, so yeah, they're they're separate meetings, so we shouldn't have that uh, problem again. Okay, great. I just wanted to clear up any confusion using the the YouTube link. So, thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. That's great. See you, Doug. Talk to you later. Okay, bye. Yes, yes, Willie. Um, there's uh, operations email that came out or uh, email that came out yesterday that has the link. Um, you can go through it through there. I, I'm just can, trying to hang it up. Okay, yep, go questions. ahead. Go ahead. I was Sorry, just responding to a, con, or a comment on YouTube. Sorry. Right. I'm going to go ahead. I, I'm and, just hanging up. If anyone yeah. has questions, yeah. sorry, I keep talking over you. I don't mean to. You're good. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody? I'll be ending the stream in one minute. The okay. YouTube stream. Okay. Okay, cool. Anisia has just put the link to uh, the website also in this chat. It, it got, it was emailed to everybody a couple of times today, I think. But there it is again um, for anyone who needs it. Anybody have a question? I'm gonna I'm gonna leave in just a minute or two. Last call for questions while you got us on here. <laughs> Someone's texting me saying you're still live on YouTube. <laughs>